All right, I just wanted to welcome everyone. Thanks for attending this session. And I'm going to switch it on over to let the presenters give their talk. And just want to remind you to please keep yourself muted. Thanks so much. All right, cool. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> I'm Vince Rossi. Um, I lead the 3D program at the Smithsonian Institution. I'm excited to be here with uh, Emmett Lalish from Google. He's a senior software engineer, and he's going to be talking about uh, Google's model viewer web component. I'm also here with Jamie Cope. Jamie's the 3D program lead developer. He'll be talking about uh, Voyager, the Smithsonian's 3D web component uh, for visualizing and interacting with 3D models, and Hafam, who is our senior web developer at the Smithsonian. Um, before we get to the, the meat of the presentation, the web components, um, I wanted to give a little bit of background about the Smithsonian. Um, so we're not one museum, we're actually 19 different museums. We have nine research centers, um, a national zoo, and we have scientists operating in over 100 countries around the world. Um, and we have this huge collection. We have 155 million objects, but less than 1% of this collection can ever be on physical display. And obviously, in COVID times, um, most of the museums are closed. They're, they're starting to reopen with timed entry. But even under normal conditions, uh, the majority of our collection objects are just not accessible to the public. Um, so that's something that excites our team, that we take that as a challenge. A quick glimpse of some of the stuff we have behind the scenes. This is just at the Natural History Museum um, in DC. So you can see we have all these amazing things. And what inspires our team is, how can we use 3D scanning tools to unlock these objects? So first we'll 3D scan the thing, the object or the specimen, but then we need a way to view it. And that's what uh, Jamie, Emmett, and Ha are gonna be talking about. So I'll talk quickly about 3D technology. Um, we use everything, um, or I should say, we, we scan everything from insects to air, aircraft, as well as spacecraft and everything in between. So in this huge collection, uh, basically the slide shows you that there's no one 3D scanning tool that will capture all of our objects. I'll also mention that we're not looking at 3D scanning 155 million objects, but we are looking at ways to increase the throughput and efficiencies of these scanning systems. Uh, because we have everything from insects to airplanes, we, we need different scanning solutions uh, to scan those different types of objects and specimens. Um, two projects I wanna quickly highlight, uh, the Apollo 11 command module, here we're looking at renders of 3D data. So if you were to go to the National Air and Space Museum, you could see the outside of the object, but you couldn't obviously get inside and maybe you can kind of peek inside to look at the cockpit. Now with the 3D scan, we're able to do some really cool things that we just can't um, do in the museum. Um, we're able to virtually get inside the command module and have a really incredibly immersive experience. Um, so this is a, kind of shows you the power of the technology. Um, so now we're kind of being seated in the pilot seat where Michael Collins would have sat. And we're looking at the control panel. And we're also able to interrogate this data in ways we can't with the object. We could do a cross section, we could look inside of it, look at that uh, negative space between the crew compartment and the exterior. Uh, looking quickly at the anatomy of a 3D model, we have Apollo's, or excuse me, Neil Armstrong's spacesuit. So we're looking at the volume data right now, or the, the surface data, and then we add color to that data. So we have two different scanning systems, uh, one that captures the geometry and another system that captures the color. So here you can see we have incredibly high resolution. So our team unlocks these objects to the world by 3D scanning them, in this case, the interior and the exterior. But then we try to take that further where we kind of marry this data with uh, the subject matter expert. So here you can see that we're mapping um, information onto the object through annotations, and we can do much more than that, but hopefully that gives you an idea. All right, so one of the things my team is excited about is that a lot of our data had a pretty restrictive license, and that license for most of our data um, got very unrestrictive recently. Um, we now have a lot of data, over 2,000 models that are CC0. And I encourage you to check out the website. I know Ha is going to talk about this later and show you where to go if you wanted to download any of these 3D models and play with either Google's Model Viewer or Smithsonian's uh, Voyager. Um, and now I'm going to pass it off to Emmett Lalish, who's going to talk about 
uh, Google's model viewer. Thank you. I'll just share my screen here. All right, so yes, um, thank you for the intro, Vince. And I'm Emmett from Google, and I work on an open source web component called Model Viewer. And Model Viewer is completely free because the whole point is to demonstrate the power of web components um, and why these this kind of new style of library is really powerful, especially for complicated tasks like uh, 3D models. Um, so really what we're here to do is take uh, you know, the display of interactive 3D models, which I think people think of as a potentially daunting task, and turn it into something that's as simple as a line of HTML. Um, and so this is great for viewing on the web, but also um, as an entry point to AR experiences, um, which kind of give an even more, you know, true scale and the kind of in your space feel um, to, to experience these things that again, you know, maybe they're hiding in the back of a museum somewhere, but you can really bring them, uh, bring them to your living room effectively. Um, and of course, we're really thrilled that uh, the Smithsonian actually adopted Model Viewer for their um, Corals experience they launched recently, which they'll be talking more about later on. Um, you can, of course, find all of our documentation on our website, modelviewer.dev. Uh, we have lots of examples there. Um, we also have an editor there, um, which allows you to sort of uh, tour through some of our, um, some of our API and uh, build things even more simply. It can actually uh, spit out little HTML snippets for you and such um, to make it that much easier to uh, plug into your website. So you know, the main reason why we built this web component is because traditionally 3D, putting 3D content on the web has been hard. Uh, and to give you an example of that, um, you know, traditionally this was done with the WebGL API, which is extremely powerful, extremely capable, but at the end of the day, it's basically a JavaScript wrapper around an old C API. And as such, it is verbose and it is complicated and it requires the knowledge of a lot of things, a lot of things like vector algebra um, and shader languages and all kinds of other stuff. So, you know, what you're looking at right here, um, I don't expect you to take all, all of this in, but this is a minimal example. This is the minimum amount of code, basically, that you need using WebGL to get, I kid you not, a single colored triangle onto your website. Um, I think in general, we're actually looking for a bit more than this out of our 3D experiences. Um, and as you can imagine, as things get more complicated, so too does your WebGL code. Um, and those code bases can get pretty extreme. And with that kind of a barrier to entry, it's hard to get a lot of 3D content on the web. Um, it's been the domain of experts for a long time, and we're trying to change that. And we're trying to change that in a way because, you know, what's beautiful about the web is that HTML is easy. Really, that's its whole purpose, is to be the easy way to build documents on the web. And it's a big part of why the web has grown so dramatically. Um, because you don't really need to be an expert programmer to make a beautiful HTML website. And the other power of HTML is it's composable, right? You can put pieces together any way that you want to create rich experiences. Um, and, you know, so a really simple example of that, right, is, oh, you know, you want to put an image on a website. Oh, you want that image to now be a link to somewhere. That's, that's fine. You can do this declarative mixing of things together. And we all kind of understand how this works intuitively. Um, the, the document tree is, is a nice, simple way to represent how things can all attach to each other. Well, what if instead of static images, we started thinking about 3D models. Now, <laughs> it's actually a little bit unfortunate that we here on Zoom uh, can actually only describe things as videos, right? <laughs> this, this is what we can do in a presentation, because uh, in fact, presentations don't yet support 3D models, although I expect they will eventually. Um, and right now, you know, we can show you, oh, here is this pretty thing, but well, why didn't you just give me a video? The reason we're not just giving you a video is because the real power of having a 3D model on your website is it's actually interactive. Whereas a video fundamentally is about passive consumption, what 3D models give you is 
interactivity. They give you engagement because now your users can decide where they want to look at it from. They can move it around as they see fit. And the ability, especially with modern physically based rendering, as you're seeing here, the fact that you can have real material properties on your objects, you can apply any lighting environment you want. That means that when you can move an object and see how the light plays off of it, you get a very clear idea of what that material actually is, right? I don't think there's any doubt in people's mind that this is some kind of a glossy metallic, um, you know, kind of damaged, um, scratched up object, right? Uh, and, and that's immediately clear, um, and even more so when, when you control the experience. And the beauty of this is if you want to give this three-dimensional interactive experience, we're making it so that it's really not any different than inserting an image or a video element into your website, right? It's just, it's a custom element. So now you have a model viewer tag. And sure enough, just like an image, you would set the source now in this case to a GLTF, um, which is a Kronos standard file format. And the power of the GLTF standardization is that unlike previous model formats, We've actually standardized the way materials are represented physically, and therefore we've standardized the way that renderers will reproduce them on the screen. And that's incredibly important because it means now that you don't have to do the work to tell your computer how to render it. Just by giving us a file format, we can actually reproduce it faithfully, and you can be confident that whatever lighting you apply, because in fact we allow any custom lighting to be applied in this element as well and lots of other customizations, um, you know that it will actually be represented faithfully. And what's even more powerful is we've done the work to make this efficient, which means now even on a relatively low-end mobile device, GPUs have come so far that you can actually get these accurate physical representations of an object even on your phone. Um, and, and you don't need the latest iPhone to do it, which is pretty incredible. Um, so, you know, we, we really make an effort to make sure that this spreads across devices, across browsers. We're supported all the way down to IE 11. Um, and the, you know, the reason we're doing this is because we want to make authoring 3d content as easy as writing HTML. We don't want you to have to think about shaders. We don't want you to have to think about GPUs. We want you to be able to simply author a model and then be able to put it into your page as interactive as you want, um, connected to anything that you want, um, using the traditional methods of web development. Um, and as part of that, right, we, we do a lot of details about things that matter on the web, right? Accessibility is something that's important, I think, to all of us. And we've built this right into Model Viewer so that, you know, there's, um, for people using screen readers, for people using tab and keyboard navigation and such, um, that these experiences still bring something um, more than just, you know, an empty canvas. And I think that's really important. Um, but in addition to that, you know, a huge part of making Model Viewer a custom element is the ability to make it customizable. Because again, this is the, the core of the web, right, is, you know, the idea of CSS is that we can bring in any kind of theming, any kind of, uh, uh, customization that you need, and that can flow into all of the elements on your page, wherever they've come from. That's absolutely true of Model Viewer too. Um, and so, for instance, uh, we have these. You know, the, we make extensive use of slots. So, in this case, you can see on the left is a very simple default progress bar that we ship with. Um, that's just sort of enough to make it clear something is happening. But obviously, your page might want something that's nicer looking or that matches your theme, and you can easily do this by simply putting in a child element and saying slot equals progress bar, and then any kind of CSS that you've styled that with will naturally replace whatever our default was. And we have slots like this for lots of um, items, not just progress bars, but also uh, the poster, the, you know, this image that we show before the model has completely loaded, um, things like the enter AR button. You know, if you're making an AR experience, maybe you want that to be localized to every language. And maybe you have a system on your website for doing that. Well, now you can simply put that in as its own custom slot and you don't have to worry about whether we've got support for it or not. Um, it'll always just work. Uh, and then of course, you know, AR is obviously important to us as well. Um, that's kind of a big thing these days. There's a lot of different ways to do AR. 
Uh, we support three different ones natively, in fact. Um, Scene Viewer is a native app on Android. Uh, Quick Look is a similar native app on iOS. We can launch both of those, but we're especially excited um, that now within Chrome, we support the standard, uh, the web standard, WebXR. And what's really important about WebXR is it allows this customization from the web to actually flow through into AR naturally. What you'll see here is we entered AR, but the, the custom carousel down on the bottom here, that has nothing to do with Model Viewer, right? These are just DOM elements and CSS that we put on our page. But since the AR experience hasn't left the browser in this case, we're able to maintain all of that. And so now, like, if I want to select these carousel items to change the model that I'm looking at, um, no problem, right? It all just happens naturally. And when I jump back out of AR into the 3D mode, my state is all maintained, the user experience is consistent, uh, and I, that's this really key element of being able to use WebXR for these things, um, as it means now that anything that you wanted to do in terms of custom experience, whether it's through you know, event listeners on pointers, or whether you're looking at you know, having responses to elements and JavaScript and anything you want to do, it all functions. Uh, and so you can see here that, for instance, uh, we also support um, hotspots and annotations. And again, this is all done naturally through DOM. So, you know, here are things that basically they look like they're attached to 3D because, in fact, we've given them coordinates within the model's reference frame. But all of the styling and all of the, the actual content of those is just regular DOM. So we're able to do this with all of the standard techniques of web development and all of the power of that. And again, it flows naturally right into the AR scene with WebXR. And so now if you want to, you know, click on these hotspots and have that change something about the model or have it give more descriptions or even have it link to a new page, all of that is going to work naturally the way you'd expect any website to. Um, but it gives us that interactivity within the 3D scene now. Um, and that's, that's really the power that web components give us is that all of the web development tools that you're used to using work pretty much the same way you'd expect, but now incorporating this 3D and interactive environment. And uh, so now I'm going to go ahead and pass this along to uh, Jamie at, uh, to talk about the Voyager viewer at Smithsonian that has some even deeper features. Thanks, Emmett. And okay. All right. So yeah, as Emmett mentioned, um, I'm going to talk about how we at the Smithsonian are working to address uh, those same challenges of getting 3D content on the web. So what we've done is we've created um, a whole suite of software tools that help to automate our pipeline from that initial capture event uh, that Vince talked about to uh, processing of that data into a 3D model, um, then on to authoring an experience around that model and then presenting it uh, to the public via our API. Um, all these tools are still in development, um, but our two main tools, Cook and Voyager, that we use for the processing, authoring, and viewing um, are actually in regular production use by us. And today what I'll be talking about um, is our Voyager set of web components. So what is Voyager? Well, it has a, has a back end and a front end. Um, the back end is a component that we call Voyager Story, and that's used by curators, authors, and other content matter experts to craft those experiences around our 3D content. And that might involve um, placing annotations, uh, adding articles and additional images, uh, maybe even uh, curated tours of the object, whatever they feel like um, helps to tell the story um, of that model. Uh, but that component, the story component, is also used by our 3D technicians um, on the back end to uh, review the data, to go through our QC process to make sure that the models and the textures um, are all as we expect um, and don't have any issues that need to be resolved. Then on the front end, um, we have our Voyager Explorer component. And that's what you'll see if you go to our website at uh, 3d.si.edu. And that's what we use to serve these experiences that we've crafted um, on the back end to the public. 
And Voyager Explorer at its core is uh, similar to Model Viewer in that it allows you to render um, an interactive 3D model. Um, but it also layers on top um, another set of functionality that supports that uh, richer learning experience. Um, so that involves things like an article reader for that additional content I mentioned earlier, um, as well as our uh, object space annotations um, and uh, some additional tools like the ability to measure your object, um, look at a cut through of it, um, and even change uh, material properties and lighting and things like that. We also have a component called Voyager Mini. Um, that's essentially uh, the same as Voyager Explorer, but with all that uh, additional uh, experiential layer stripped out of it. So it's basically just um, the ability to render and interact with the model. And the idea behind that is we can use that um, as essentially a very low overhead uh, 3D thumbnail um, that's still interactive and engaging, but serves more as a conduit to that uh, richer Voyager Explorer experience. So why Voyager? Well, um, in a traditional museum environment, what we have are we have physical objects stored in collections. Um, we get those objects out, we add lights, we pose them, um, we add props, and then we add some additional educational content to help tell a story around that object. Well, with Voyager, our goal is to go through that same process, um, but with our digital assets. So on this slide, on the left, you'll see a, a screenshot of a scan that we did of a collections object. Um, then on the right, we have um, the model that resulted from that scan of the collections object um, seen in our Voyager Explorer component. And here we've added lighting, um, we've posed it, we've added props, which in this case are annotations that describe points on the surface. And then we've added our additional content, um, which here is an article and an image um, that that curator thought was important um, to tell, uh, to go along with this view of this model. And so now I'd like to show you a couple of brief uh, real-time demos of the back and front end components. So here we have our uh, Voyager story component uh, that's loaded up with that same model from the slides. Um, you can see there's quite a bit of uh, UI accompanying this view here. Um, on the left, we have a, uh, a scene map um, that shows you uh, everything you have in that scene. It shows you the, the objects as well as the lighting and the camera. Um, and then the top, on top of the UI, um, we have buttons that represent and initiate each of the stages of our uh, experience creation process. Um, we have posing of the model. Um, we have capturing uh, thumbnails. We have reviewing derivatives. And derivatives in this case are uh, lower resolution versions um, of that same model. And the idea behind the derivatives are we, is that we may have um, end users who have situations like low bandwidth, or they might have older hardware and serving them a super high resolution model is just gonna be a really sluggish and degraded experience. So we have these lower res models that we can serve um, in those appropriate situations. Um, then we have uh, the ability to add annotations. Um, you can create and attach articles. You can create those custom tours as well as targeted interaction and some global settings. Um, and each one of these tasks, when you select them, um, they'll appear, uh, the details will appear in this task window um, after you select a model, and then the task will be accomplished in the main window. And I don't have the opportunity to go through um, all of these uh, during this talk, but I did wanna mention that uh, almost all of our, our steps in our process all have a, a pretty, what we think of as intuitive, uh, what you see is what you get uh, interface. So for instance, um, with tours, um, to create a tour stop, all you need to do is recreate in this Explorer view what you'd like your end users to see when they get to that stop in the tour. So you can reposition your model, you can turn on or off annotations, um, you could add you know, an article that you want to be open at that step in the tour, and then just save that step. And then that's what will be recreated and presented to your end user um, when they get to that point in the tour. And when you've finished um, all the steps and you've gotten everything the way you want it, um, you'll click save in the interface and that will uh, take all that information and that configuration and save it out to a scene descriptor file. And now I will switch over to um, the front end. Um, right now I'm on our website, 3d.si.edu. And I've searched for uh, the collections page for that same object. Um, and this is a, a Drupal site. Um, and you'll see that uh, this is that same interactive style module, but this is actually our front end. So a lot of that UI um, 
for the, the backend authoring interface is not there. Um, then on the right, we have additional details about this object that come directly from a database. Um, but within our Explorer module, um, we have this menu on the left-hand side that allows you to access that additional functionality. So you can start tours, you can view articles, um, you can turn on and off the annotations, which are also clickable to provide you additional information. Um, you can also, uh, you know, also access this other additional functionality that I mentioned, like measuring and slicing through your object. And just wanted to briefly uh, talk about that scene descriptor file that I mentioned, since that kind of for us serves as the intermediary between our back end component and our front end component. Um, it's a JSON standard format um, itself. It saves information like the pose, lighting, annotations, etc. Um, but it also has URIs embedded in it that point to our external resources, um, like our 3D assets, um, which are also uh, GLTF format, um, like uh, Emmett mentioned with Model Viewer, um, as, as well as uh, our things like our articles, additional images, and any thumbnails we may have created. I also wanted to talk about uh, where we're headed with our Voyager project. So uh, to this point, what I've showed are basically uh, experiences designed around a single object. And we really think we can take our technology to the next level by supporting uh, multiple objects and maybe even entire collections of objects. Uh, but the issue right now is that uh, is twofold. Uh, first, from a technical perspective, if we were to take, say, um, these four presidential models, dump them into uh, a component, add our lights, our pose, our props, and our content, um, what we would most likely get is just a really degraded user experience, you know, with this spinning loading icon. Um, and that's not what we want to provide. Um, additionally, there's some challenges to storytelling with that many objects. Um, if you're going to uh, view an entire collection, you want to be able to talk about that collection as a whole and, and, and compare and contrast the individual objects, but you still want to be able to uh, look at those objects on their own and tell their individual stories. Um, so that's uh, definitely a challenge. So here I'd like to uh, show you a brief video about what we're trying to do to address some of those challenges with multi-model presentations. Um, so what we have here is we have a collection of coral models that our subject matter experts thought were important to show together, again, so that they can be contrasted and compared, but also we still want to maintain um, the individual stories of those objects. So if I hit play, um, what you'll see when it loads um, is that all the coral models are posed together. We can navigate around the center of the group to view the collection as a whole. Each model is what we call thumb quality, so it's essentially the 3D version of an image thumbnail. It uses lower resolution geometry and textures than the original models. And then by clicking on one of these thumbnail models, uh, we initiate a visual transition from the model group to the single selected model and its associated content. The view is now centered on that model and along the way, a higher resolution model has been streamed in to replace that thumbnail. Then when we're done with this content, um, we, we can return back to the model group and we can select another item. This allows the user to um, explore the collection content by drilling down without losing the connection and the context of the collection as a whole. It also allows us to address um, some of those technical issues I mentioned um, by streaming in and out the resources as they're needed instead of having to front load them all um, at the beginning for all of that content. And today we've been talking about two different components um, per, that both are designed to make it easier to present 3D on the web. Um, but I wanted to highlight um, some significant differences between the two. Um, and I think fundamentally, uh, the main difference comes from um, the, the purpose or the goals um, of these respective projects. With Model Viewer, um, as Emmett mentioned, the goal is fundamentally to just get that 3D content um, rendered and interactive on the web in the easiest and most reliable way possible. Um, and that's through um, integrating it into core HTML. Um, with Voyager, um, we also want to make it easy to present that 3D content, but we're more focused on the experience that's designed around the content, making that easy to do um, and simple to provide. Uh, Model Viewer is very extensible um, and, and lightweight, so you can uh, create any of that experiential content on top of Model Viewer 
Um, so it's very flexible in that way. Voyager is less flexible, but includes um, a lot of that, that content and the functionality to support that experiential content um, in, in its component. Uh, Model Viewer, as Emmett also mentioned, has integrated AR support, which is awesome. It works really well. Um, I recommend it if you haven't tried it. Uh, Voyager does not yet, um, but it is in our roadmap. So we're hoping uh, to support that in the next couple of months. Um, they use different styles for annotations. Um, and they also both have in-browser editors, um, but keeping in, in line with uh, the purposes of the projects, uh, Model Viewer's editor is geared more towards uh, working with the scene and the object, whereas Voyager's editor is, revolves more around the experience um, and being able to craft that in-browser. Um, and a commonality, um, they both, uh, the rendering for both of them is powered uh, behind the scenes by the pretty robust uh, 3JS project which is also open source um, and available on GitHub. And lastly, um, I wanted to show you one more demo, um, which shows what we can do um, when we combine uh, the, the models and the content of the Smithsonian and the educational experience um, with Google's model viewer and a Drupal site. And that's our uh, Corals project that uh, Emmett, Emmett mentioned. So here um, is our Coral site. And as I scroll down, um, you'll see that we have individual modules, which each are composed of a model viewer component on the left, and then our traditional educational content on the right and below. And I wanted to stop here and just mention uh, mentioned one of the key points um, of why we decided to go with model viewer um, for this project. Um, and that's how you can create a different level of interaction with your educational content. So in addition to being able to rotate and zoom the model, um, as you can with both components, um, as Emmett mentioned, uh, the, the model viewer component embeds directly into your HTML. So in, in actually different parts of it, including the annotations, are actually um, uh, document elements themselves. So it's easy to access them and interact, them, interact with them with basic JavaScript. So here with our traditional uh, text content, as you read through it, um, you'll see that we have some words that are highlighted and actually made into a button. So if you click on that button, um, we're able to reorient the camera of the model and open up the annotation that describes the cross section um, that we made um, that button for. So that shows you just one simple example of how um, using Model Viewer um, in an HTML page um, and in a, in a Drupal page, um, which is what this is, um, you can add an additional level of interaction beyond what a, a 3D component provides. And now I'd like to hand it off to Ha, who will talk about how you can embed um, either of these components um, into your Drupal site. I think you might be muted, huh? But I was sharing the meaning of life and you guys completely missed it. But uh, can you hear me now? Yep, you're good. Okay, sorry about that. So um, now that you we've mentioned how we create these models and the different tools that you can use to display them, how do we find these models? Uh, they're available on 3d.si.edu slash explore. And you can basically embed all of our models, but as Vincent uh, mentioned, we launched the open access initiative earlier this year. So the majority of these models are, um, open access and therefore uh, there's no restrictions in terms of copyright and things like that to just really search for these uh, open access models. Just click on the open access media checkbox, click the search box and the page will reload. And like I said, we've got about 3,500 models and 2,300 of them are open access. So, if you go into the page itself, there's a share button 
That's the iframe, and that is the easy way to embed the 3D Voyager and the model that you're looking at onto your website. If you want to, um, so if you want to do a little bit more manipulation with the models, add annotations, kind of create context around it, then I recommend using the model viewer. And basically to use that, you just need to embed, um, include these two JavaScripts and then copy the link of the GLB or the GLTF models from 3d.si.edu. And you can find that basically on most of our open access uh, models. If you click the download button, you can see uh, the we some we will provide a GLB or a GLTF file. Just copy that link and you know insert it into the model viewer tag. You can also visit modelviewer.dev. It has a lot of documentation about the attributes, uh, how to add annotations, how to change the camera orbit. And the way we did it for the Corals project was we basically used the paragraph uh, module. And so I'm just gonna walk you through that page that Jamie was looking at. So basically each of these blocks are a paragraph bundle. The annotation themselves are a separate paragraph bundle because they are, they needed to, to be rendered slightly different. But um, we did the paragraph bundle and then we used a pre-process entity hook to add the scripts and to you know, make any changes to the data and then a custom template. And that's just, and it was very simple to embed this into our existing Drupal site. Um, these are the GitHub repos and the documentation for Model Viewer if you're interested in finding out more. And um, if you have questions, please let us know. Well, thanks for that presentation to all of you. That was great, really awesome. Such cool, <laughs> amazing stuff. Um, I see uh, one question from Linda. Uh, she asked, how do you plan to integrate accessibility into your project? I'm not sure which project, um, whether it's the, um, the tool that Google provides or the um, tool that the Smithsonian has made specifically. Uh, it was touched on earlier, but if someone could address that, that'd be great. Well, I can say that in Model Viewer, as I said, we, we do build accessibility in. Um, and of course, we're constantly trying to improve it. So, you know, um, right now we're mostly focused on kind of making sure that the model is navigatable. Um, from you know keyboard and that kind of thing um, and, and of course we have like screen reader stuff to uh, to give an idea of sort of how you've um, how you're viewing the object and give a little bit of context there um, not to mention just sort of make sure that it flows through with the normal accessibility of a, of a web page that that's built into um, but you know we're definitely interested in, in other ideas there have been thoughts about um, making better accessibility 3D rendering by, for instance, having like high contrast modes for the rendering and that kind of thing. Um, various various ideas along those fronts. We haven't gotten to that point yet, um, but I think that those would be interesting to look at in the future. And I could tell from, um, I can speak from our experience with the Corals project that because model viewer, uh, you know, it's just another HTML element on your site, you can easily change your theme to make sure that there is at least the elements that you add to the model viewer. Those elements do have the color contrast and all the necessary tags in there to make it accessible. Yeah, and I can uh, mention with Voyager, um, we have a number of the same goals um, that Emmett talked about. Um, we're not quite as far along um, as uh, model viewer yet, but we also, um, to some degree, uh, support screen readers and plan to expand that. Um, and also um, are looking at uh, alternate uh, interaction paradigms and how we can support those. Yeah, 
There's a question from Peter uh, about whether the links and resources, I, I guess maybe your slide deck will be available in the GovCon site. Uh, if it isn't already, I'm not aware. I just shared a link to the slides and we'll, we'll tweet them out. Um, Thanks so much. I had a question. Uh, is there any um, accessibility, I'm oh, sorry, uh, privacy or security concerns with embedding these tools or things on a government website? I realize a lot of it's open source and you could roll your own, but if you just want to embed something on, you know, from the Smithsonian onto another government site, what might be loaded by doing that? So in the case of Model Viewer, at least, um, being a web component is, is great because it means we're, we're very much self-contained. Um, you know, we're within the sandbox of the browser. And the power of WebGL means that, in fact, everything is happening locally, right? There is no communication with the server. There's not like server-side rendering or, or something like that. Um, so in fact, everything that you see is, is actually being processed directly on your phone. Um, and there's, in fact, no way, like, <laughs> I mean, as a developer of Model Viewer, it would be fantastic if I knew something like, say, how many people were using Model Viewer, but I couldn't even find that out if I wanted to. Um, because in fact, that's, it's, it's just like an image tag on a website. Um, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't have any way to phone home. And from a content perspective, from the 3D models themselves, um, if we make it available um, online, it can be shared, it can be embedded. We, we want that to happen. Um, the only restriction would be an example of like an art object that would still be under copyright. In that case, we would make the model um, viewable, but we would uh, not necessarily make the downloads available because the object is under copyright. But luckily, the vast majority of the things we've scanned um, don't have restrictions and have that CC0 license. And I can mention for Voyager, um, it, it's very similar to, to what Emmett mentioned being you know, self-contained as a component. Um, one difference is we do have the capability. So if you were to use the share code um, that Ha mentioned to directly embed um, a, a complete uh, Voyager module from our site, <clears throat> excuse me, we do have um, a Google Analytics uh, tag that is that sends some custom um, data back to us. So that allows us, it's all um, anonymous, but that allows us to gather some metrics on some of our different tools. So we can see, um, you know, if people are using uh, certain, certain tools like the measuring or, or the cut through tool and what is most important for us to support, um, as well as uh, with like reading articles and things like that, which are most popular, um, but it isn't gathering any information on like, who is using it and you know what their hardware is or anything like that. That's great, thanks for all those answers. Does anyone else in the uh, uh, room here have any questions they wanted to ask verbally? Great, unmute. Well, I had one. I'm sorry to just jump in here again. But uh, Hav, um, I noticed you when you were sharing, there was one slide. Did you click over to a tab and it didn't show what you were showing? Were you trying to show the uh, Drupal Paragraphs interface? I would love to see that if that was the intent. Sure, I can show the paragraph. Uh, I'm not sure which slide did not, like, where the disconnect happened. So was it when I was talking about how we built it, how we basically uh, use paragraphs to build this? Yeah, I think so. It, it seemed like you were intending to show another tab, but it stayed on the presentation tab. Ah, but gotcha. maybe I was maybe I was imagining No, it. I, I did switch over to uh, the site, our site, to show you. I'd love to see that, that'd be awesome. Um, let me log in and I can show you the back end as to how we built this. We did this in seven because uh, we're still migrating to eight, but you can easily do this in eight as well. And in fact, I've actually done it in eight, uh, also using paragraphs. 
So let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay. So let's uh, basically walk through this page. Uh, I'm not quite sure what it is you guys see. Give me one second. Uh, do you see the uh, ecosystem engineers? Yes. Okay. So each of these blocks of content is a paragraph bundle. Um, we wanted to add context, so we provided you know text blocks and um, text fields for this information. But then we also added a bunch of fields that were specific to the model viewer, and if this let me see if the edit option comes up for this page so uh this is the back end and it's taken a while to load i'm not sure why but these are the specific viewer um fields that we use it's basically a link field a text field another text field and basically I did not do any validation because I trust that Jamie knew what content to put in and because I wasn't quite sure what to validate. But uh, I took the combination of all these text fields and did a um, paragraph, you know, a custom paragraph template so that it will render the HTML mockup uh, similar to this. Great, thank you. All right. Yeah, and I think that's an important point to tie in with what uh, Emmett was saying, that Model Viewer um, aims to make it really easy to, you know, drop it into HTML um, and, and configure it um, with CSS and things like that. Um, but if you have someone like Ha on your team who can set up these Drupal templates, it's, it's even easier. You don't even really need to know anything about HTML. You just fill in the fields um, and do things like here we're showing how to set the initial camera view, how to set the poster image that's seen uh, before the model loads, um, all, all sorts of things like that can be done without even knowing anything about coding. Great, well, we're out of time. So thanks to everyone. And thanks for your presentation to all of you co-presenters. And uh, thanks to everyone for attending. Thank you. Thanks so much.